Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Let me know if you can hear me. Hello, Torben. Yes, you can hear me. Great. Andreas, good to see you back. Yeah, hey, Adam. <laughs> As you can see, I'm back from a run. I've made it a... Wait a minute. <laughs> Have you shaved? <laughs> <laughs> Who's yes. this boy? Who's this well, boy? The hair is still here. It's just back because yeah, I'm back. You shave, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I did. Uh, I did shave um, in uh, the last few weeks. So if you haven't been around, then yeah, I did uh, get rid of some of the weight that the hair was putting on. See, I'm trying to lose weight, so anything I can get short of amputating a limb, I'll take. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I can't take this uh, baby face seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big problem. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I just got back from uh, from a run, and I'm one of those uh, uh, fast uh, or I don't know. The metabolism is like a flywheel with me. If I run, I'm just still sweating for an hour. So mm. and uh, it's been uh, uh, I guess 20 minutes since I went for my run and had a shower and everything, but I'm still drenched. So <laughs> it didn't take. It, the shower didn't take, as George Costanza said in Seinfeld. Yeah. <laughs> no, it didn't. And I even tried it with cold showers, thinking, you know, that would cool my body off. But it seems it has even the opposite effect. Your body just goes into overdrive, trying to keep warm, as well as <laughs> the, the energy yeah. you pent up from the run. <laughs> so anyway, hello, uh, I see. Yeah, Rick, hello, good to see you. Missed you last time. I'm sorry, I think I was late last time. Uh, by about 20 minutes or half hour or something like that. So uh, sorry if you were there last time and I wasn't. Um, some of the people did make it, so we had another we had another good one. And um, hey, and our good news from our from our partners from O Note, we can now import export uh, JSON versions of our event models. So before the collaboration piece gets finished up, we can. Uh, at least share uh, share our event models in a common format. Wait a minute. Do you have some kind of green screen thing going on? Yes. I did, you... not, I did not wallpaper my place like this. <laughs> Maybe I should. No, I, I saw I saw the edge. I saw the edge of your shirt, and then I thought, yeah, okay, there's something going on there. Yeah. No, it's a it's a backdrop. But hey, for illustrations, uh, I also got a new tablet, which is an improvement from my old one because it's got the screen built in. So you, you see what you're drawing, which is nice. So I've been practicing my, my cartooning, uh, which has been good. I've loved that all my life. And it's coming into, uh, into great uh, help when it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to illustrations for the book. So that's always good. But I can probably share with you what I'm doing. So I usually use Krita for drawing. I don't know if you can see, but my tablet. Uh, I can see, let's see. See, there's a tablet, and I can draw. Did here. you draw that face of Garfield, or did you steal it? Oh no, no, I can I can draw <laughs> Garfield very quickly. <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Garfields are easy. <laughs> That's yeah. a very fast one, but yeah, Gar Garfields are pretty easy. Um, as are houses. Um, uh, yeah, so if you, the house is is a very quick way. To, I mean, it's really good for technical drawings because I love drafting and uh, when I did engineering stuff. So being able to do you know right angles and all that. Um, uh, uh, drafting. I, did we talk about your bike racing or? What kind of drafting? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> the, the drafting <laughs> so, for, for doing this kind of stuff. I'm going to hide now. <laughs> no, no, it's good. I like I like the humor, especially dad humor. Dad, dad humor is good. I'm a dad. <laughs> so, yeah, standard standard house with path. Um, things like that are, are awesome uh, to just get testing, you know, tablets and things like that. Um, so if you... If you folks like um, uh, like this kind of stuff, I suggest uh, this. Uh, I think it's a it's half price from Wacom tablets. This thing that I got, it's a 
It's a Huon, H-U-I-O-N, um, and it's uh, exact same specs as a uh, as Wacom tablets, but half the price, which is awesome because the Wacom tablets were good ones with you know pen, uh, pen tilt sensitivity and uh, and all these other things. They're they're quite they're quite crazy. And if you if you don't know Krita, the thing that I'm using here for art, holy smokes, you got it, this actually beats Photoshop for um, uh, for things like brushes. Um, at least in my opinion, uh, let me see if I can actually take a look at, you know, look at, look at all of these different things you can do here <laughs> in terms of the aspect ratio, spacing, uh, mixtures, rotation. Um, yeah, so you can do quite a lot of stuff and it gives you a little preview at the top. Um, it gives you a secondary pressure so that if you smush a brush down, you know how it pushes the paint aside and it makes a white. So it has all the different modes for blending paint like that. It's uh, if you're, if you have the slightest interest in art, um, definitely check out, uh, uh, check out Krita because it's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, all the stuff that you can do with it. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll probably be doing a little bit more of the illustrations uh, between this, um, and probably using the pen on on Miro for general descriptions, but we'll be uh, we'll be doing uh, O note for the actual event modeling if we do anything. For, for did, did you say did you say did you say Krita? Krita, K R I. That, that's yeah yeah yeah. That's the uh, that's the MS Paint of uh, Linux, right? Oh well, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, if you're going to judge Linux more, that way, maybe a little sure. bit more Photoshop <laughs> than that. <there, Jack. laughs> uh, yeah, I, I love uh, I love this thing. It's uh, it's just really really fun uh, to uh, uh, to actually paint in this stuff uh, with it. So, but yeah, uh, for the regular stuff, I'll continue to draw on our on our shared uh, Miro for general concepts. Oh, yeah. Adam, um, did but, you say that? Did you say that uh, tablet supports like pen angles yes. as well? Yes. It's got angle and pressure. Angle and pressure and a display screen, all for about three hundred bucks, if you can imagine. And it's quite big. It's uh, it's thirteen inches across, so it's not small at all. I think the equivalent from Wacom is at least six seven hundred bucks, if, yeah, if you look at the cool. specs. But works one hundred percent in Linux, so awesome. That's a thumbs up from me. And uh, yeah, I think the only problem is that it's not Wacom. So the drivers aren't picked up by name, which makes it a little bit tricky. Um, I don't think you need a proprietary driver. I think um, the settings are a little finicky. So I had to restart my session a couple of times because in Linux, those uh, tablet and um, pointer type settings are for the uh, windowing system, which is X in uh, X sessions in, in Linux. So you have to log out, log back in for them to work. But that was the only only thing. Once you get it going, it's it's perfect. The other thing is just the number of buttons. This thing's got, uh, what is it here, six, eight buttons. But there's four in the middle, I think from four to seven, uh, that are uh, reserved. So when you're configuring these things, you always have to add four. So when the little wizard asks you how many buttons you have, instead of saying eight, you say 12. Because as you program them, you'll see that you're missing the last four on there. So that's the only thing uh, that I learned. I, I installed it on my laptop first and took the lessons from there. When I put this on my desktop, um, I uh, adjust it and works beautifully. So yeah, some of the things like uh, you know uh, rotating the canvas quickly with the pen or zooming in, zooming out, undoing, switching to erase, and all that is all done by these little quick shortcut keys that you can program. So you have basically two hands on the tablet. It's faster than pen and paper. It's quite awesome. So any artists in here or no, just me? <laughs> Am I just talking at the wall at this point? <laughs> Probably. Just, uh, all right. we're all my, my daughter, <laughs> my daughter's really getting into drawing. So yeah, well, if you have anyone that's, that's in your family, that that wouldn't appreciate something of like this, save yourself the money and uh, don't uh, overspend for, uh, for something like uh, the Wacom. I think they've become kind of the Apple of, uh, uh, of tablets. You just overpay for the same hardware, um, just for the name. So the, the Huon thing is uh, exactly the same. I mean, I, the, my previous tablet was a Wacom. This thing feels exactly like it. I mean, the, 
there's no no difference between the texture of the tip of the stylus on on the actual surface so very happy with it i'm hoping it lasts and uh so far what i've read online is that this this thing doesn't really fall apart or anything there's been no no complaints on quality so that's good mm. as for today's if you've session, seen um, <clears throat> if you've seen uh, if you've seen uh, one episode of top gear you have the most extreme example of this with branding name. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy Clarkson, he takes up a bowl. He says, now this is a bowl of sick, but if I pop a BMW badge on it, thirteen ninety five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's one of those things that's a pet peeve of mine in society. We don't, like, there's this whole brand loyalty. And I'm, guess, I'm guessing in the early days of, you know, capitalism out West, there's a whole bunch of snake oil. And so, you know, that's why you have mattress tags. You know why you have the mattress tags and says it's illegal to remove them. It's the, there was a whole rampant uh, history of uh, mattress uh, copycats for and uh, people that would just stuff them with straw and sell them for the same price. So the reason that uh, it's illegal to remove the tag on your mattress is nothing to do with safety or anything like that. It's entirely to do with uh, brand and copyright and all this kind of stuff. So uh, th this history goes back, and I'm guessing this is where you know, it, brand what, loyalty illegal happens. illegal to illegal to move the yeah, and, remove and, and, the tag on yeah, your mattress. In North America, it's illegal to remove the tag from the mattress. Um, you look yeah, at a mattress like, in North before, America before you sell it. So the 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 manu they can't take the manufacturer's tag and take it off and then sell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the store. Because uh, uh, before they sell it, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, it, it doesn't specify that. It just if you look at uh, yeah, it, yeah, once, once you buy it, you can remove it. it, it's, it it's even really, then, they, it's they hard put to tell. In to catch scammers <laughs> who are like putting in knockoffs that have, like you say, like stuff that's highly, highly flammable and and has yeah. the same name as uh, the manufacturer, right? Exactly. They they found some industrial foam. That is not up to spec and just you know stuffed it into that and put the same ah, name. In. <laughs> okay, okay. So there is so there is a special brand which has gotten a really terrible review. So they would remove those stickers from it in order to sell them as no name rather than this brand. <laughs> okay. Well, well I don't think sense. you can even have no name. I think it was such. A, I think the mattress industry is a special one because I don't see that kind of requirement on many other things. I only see it for safety things on electronics, like the specific kind of uh, certification that it won't cause a house fire. Well, like I think that. it was basically you'd go into um, you'd go into a store. They got all these mattresses, like the sales guy. Oh no, that's a brand name mattress. So they'd sell you it for brand name price. You get it home and then try and warranty it, and find out oh no, that's just some cheap knockoff that you spent an extra whatever on. And well, that's not taking the brand. That's not taking the sticker off. That's adding a fake brand to well, the mattress. I think they used to not have stickers on them, like attached really strongly. So they just say, oh, no, there's no stickers on mattresses. We just know. You can tell by the designers, you know, so they used to be uh, easy to tear off. Oh, someone posted the link to my tablet. You guys found it very quickly. Yes, that's the one. Oh, it's so good. The, the canvas 13, not with an N, but with an M. Just to, sorry, to finish off that subject. So Thomas uh, posted in the chat the link um, to that tablet. Um, but yeah, yeah, you should, US, you should be spending about 250 or so on it. And for that money, holy smokes, totally, totally worth it. Um, you, yeah. Just an idea for Christmas time, right? <laughs> People are stuck at home during lockdown. We might as well practice art, right? So, uh, oh, for today's subject, sorry. Great to chat about all these random things. It's always nice to chat with you guys. But um, I thought we would uh, go over some of the um, discussions that we had on Twitter about um, uh, about sagas and uh, go back into that because some people had uh more questions about just you know they can't get their heads around how you get away from the idea of a process manager of whether something needs to live in its own container to actually be an orchestrator for something and uh maybe we want to go through some examples of uh you know the, the trip booking or whatever 
uh, just to draw out, you know, decompose the idea of a saga uh, into those components, just just to see and demystify it for people. Because I, I think I'm always, uh, you know, jargon police, you know, buzz, buzzword bingo and things like that. There's a reason the kind of, um, um, I guess, what's the word? Uh, not sarcastic, but uh, uh, my vocabulary has disappeared over the last <laughs> 24 hours for some reason. I had a horrible sleep. Um, uh, disengage, no. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Come on, Rick, you're a master of the English language. You can put it in a sentence. <laughs> so, you know, people have become um, indifferent. Indifferent, yes, maybe. Um, I think oh. uh, skeptical. Uh, what's the other word? Oh, uh, allergic. <laughs> apathetic. Apathetic. <laughs> apathetic. Yeah, that could work as well. Uh, anyway, there's another word that's better. I know what it is. And you know, when you're thinking of the exact word, it's the furthest thing in your brain. That's what oh, I'm just suffering tell from us the right meaning. <laughs> What's that? The word doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so, so people have, um, yeah, uh, people, people have different reactions. So one of the reasons that, you know, event modeling wants to be kind of anti all these other things, it's not really anti those things. It embodies those things. It actually believes in the goals of all these other things that we use different terms for. I just think that a lot of these terms are either people think they're co-opted or they invite a whole other school of thought, et cetera. So you end up, uh, when you say saga or process manager, someone that comes from the world of Kafka or whatever, that to them brings in that entire you know infrastructure maybe when someone brings that up in the meeting. Oh, we're going to have an orchestrator for this. So someone from the IBM world thinks of you know whatever components they used to sell uh, uh, so there's a lot of baggage. And so, um, I would like to, um, uh, two people are waiting. I'm wondering if they're legit. One is legit, but another one's a zoom at a zoom. So hold on here. Let me see. Oh, and I gotta make this. We lost, should no, Krzysztof is here. Oh, good. He's back from his holidays. I'll make him co-host and I'll make Rick co-host. Yes. Because Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. You you look like you're tan? No. Did you get a tan? Not really. <laughs> how, how, how the hell do you do this? Do you have the uh, northern lights there? How do you do that? Uh, that's just active. <laughs> like there's a background thing in Zoom you can do. Um, well, oh, I'm a newbie in Zoom. So. Yeah. Uh, I really, I ran out of time today. I really wanted to switch to YouTube. Um, broadcasting and just have the you know the usual suspects in in the zoom as well we'll see if we can get that going but uh, uh, Rick Rick here he is I'll make you a co-host as well yeah right. so does everyone sort of know what I'm talking about when you know we get into process manager saga middleware rules engine yeah yeah uh, actually on my very first try on implementing event sourcing back in 2012, we did um, do sagas and we implemented it in a, maybe a really wrong way, but we had this with events with uh, that contain commands in them. So that the next, uh, I can't remember that solution. I'll get back to that later. Well, so that's <laughs> I'll something- I'll raise my hand as a- Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just going to raise my hand as a super beginner here. And so if you if you wouldn't mind, um, all I know when I think of sagas and stuff like that is like long running processes. Yeah, exactly. That's so, that's a proper that's a much better way to put it. Yeah. So let's give a let's give an example of a saga that we wanted to talk about today. Like what kind of saga would we talk about? Like a real world example. Uh, well, I mean, well, our our. I was, our, our example was a, a document handling system where, oh, yeah. um, where there are different, uh, <laughs> different uh, actors who work on it. So it's, it's in the queue and now it's awaiting um, work from this person and then work from this person, then approval from this person and so on. That's, isn't that a... Yeah, it is. I, I, although I hate, there's a couple of domains that I kind of hate as examples for event sourcing. Um, insurance is one of them. 
Uh, and it comes up quite a lot because uh, insurance, you want event sourcing and the traceability of what happened. Um, okay, this was public public management, you know, uh, in Bergen. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I'll get back to your specific example, but you touched on something that when you're talking about documents, a lot of this document wrangling ends up being in uh, found in, in insurance. And the reason I don't like it is because usually the documents look as one giant blob that changes state as being, you know, we wrote more to the document. So now it's a new version. Um, and it's really hard to dissect the document into sections and who is, you know, uh, responsible for what. So it's a real clumsy way to learn event sourcing. It's very applicable and uh, you just have to, you know, get your events uh, scoped right. And that comes with experience in that particular domain. But if I was to teach someone event sourcing, um, that's definitely not the domain I would use. Uh, to true, true. Uh, it's just there's also this. <laughs> there's this one example in King of Queens where he talks to one of Carrie's colleagues. Mm, the documentation of the mm, document. Really? Yeah. That's so exciting. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so perhaps it's not the most exciting. Domain. No, so I don't think we'll do that. I think, I mean, the one that I've used all the time is trip booking, and I think it's used also. I'm not actually, I don't remember. I should pick the pick that book up again. The the Microsoft Patterns and Practices book on on event sourcing, Securus and event sourcing, that was done in 2012. Um, I don't. I think they might have had an aside where uh, trip booking was used for a saga. The the reason, the other reason not to use the word SAGA is that it has a very specific technical um, definition from the 80s where it was a very um, tech level orchestration of distributing, of, uh, of distributing one large transaction across smaller databases along the way um, or something to that effect. Um, so it's a loaded term. Um, like these lengthy um, workflows that someone mentioned earlier Routing, routing slips, um, those are better names for it. Um, I just like to throw it away entirely. So I think it overcomplicates things because people start to read, you know, uh, enterprise, uh, you know, design kind of architecture, um, you know, books, etc., where you get into queues and all these things that you think you need to scale a giant organization. And uh, uh, realistically, um, you know, going into the enterprise patterns books, they, they really made a, a mountain out of a molehill. Maybe it was necessary at some point, but certainly in, in my experience, we've rarely needed to rely on a lot of those things. There's some things that are, that make sense. You have fancy names for them, like correlation, causation, IDs, et cetera. It's like, uh, well, just name things. Like it's, it's in your business anyway. And you know, the tired old thing that I say, if you did this without computers, You'd have an order identifier, you know, you'd have a invoice number, you'd have these things that would allow you to trace through and see, you know, how the whole um, manifest ended up at the end when you shipped something that it had the accounting for where the product came from. You know, it might have had some line items added at the bottom as to which warehouses it went through, you know, these shipping slips and all that kind of stuff is already prior knowledge even without kind of prior art uh, before even uh, computing. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of make work kind of stuff in here where cool. as, as geeks, we want to build our own little systems. So things are nice and tidy in in the way we think of a problem. And then I guess some loudest voices in the industry ended up writing books about their favorite thing. Um, so, you know, um, I, I believe we can use what we already have in our brains. And uh, Well, it, it's not always true that empty heads or empty barrels are the loudest. I mean, take, for instance, Greg, Greg Young. He's very loud, but he's definitely not. Yeah, no, I'm not saying everyone. I'm not saying everyone. And unfortunately, there's, very, there's, there's a lot of smart people with, that are very quiet um, and have really good ideas. Uh, the, you know, the flip side of that. So, you know. And uh, and then there's people in between, uh, all all throughout the thing. Um, however, I think it's dangerous when the when the trivial things or the empty-headed things become the loudest. And uh, 
sometimes that happens and you just have to watch out for it. Um, and so I think there's a greater negative effect um, as a whole when you start to see uh, especially enterprise patterns uh, being you know brandied about as, as substitutes for actual experience um, certifications based on how you you know memorize some patterns that really are not necessary, right? I mean, you can be successful a lot of times, way more successful without them, simply because as an organization, you have to act as a team. And if the whole team has to memorize way more, you know, they keep talking about this, they're not as effective um, simply because there's way more room for mistakes of mis misinterpretation um, or misapplication by so many things. So you need to keep things simple. It's like, a, it's one of those things about entropy, keep things organized and keep, keep things simple. Our entropy in, in IT is this, um, seeing something old and thinking it's new because it's in our current solution, our Snowflake somehow, if, especially if we're new, we see our current problem that we're working on, our inventory system as like, oh, these are really cool patterns. I bet everyone would love to use these you know, not knowing that it's already been done many times before. And we think these higher level patterns are fundamental when they're not. And I think that's, that's kind of what happens to a lot of people. Adam, mm -hmm. how about we, um, here's, a, here's, a, here's an idea, right? Because it's around uh, having people engaged. And uh, when we start talking about sagas, what they are, people like have all this baggage from technical implementations and everything else, right? So yeah. let's maybe start a little bit simpler into um, language and what the heck we mean by SAG. And I'm going to ask a specific question and see if we can actually come to, a, you guys can come to a shared explanation that makes me say we're on the same page. And that is, what's the difference between a saga and a workflow or a business process? Which is just like, hey, if you're talking to real people, you're going business people, we should use a word that they understand. So saga and workflow are the same thing. Why are we making this word saga, right? Right. Why yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't use any of them. I mean, right. to, to so, tell you honestly, it's about, you know, can you guys tell me why you want to use a word at all? I mean, right. for me, yeah. it's, okay. it's an entity like I'm anything else. Sure. If I think about, if I think about, let me put it this way before we start off on this justification thing. Um, I'll say that to me, uh, an order slip in a cafe is... Yes just an entity like a particular uh, meal or a customer's tab are things. Um, thing. The routing slip that Greg uses in that cafe example of, you know, the thing that tracks your visit all the way through to me is a thing. It doesn't deserve uh, a special word. There's, cool. there's particular traits to that thing as in any other thing. This particular trait is that it seems to interact with a lot of other subsystems besides one. Sometimes you have a thing that s interacts with only one subsystem. You know, maybe the thermometer in the oven is just a kitchen thing and it never, that information never leaves the kitchen. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, the only real thing we found out through trying to, you know, make everything as basic as possible of an event modeling is if things are concerned with more than one uh, stream of accountability, if you will, like stream of whatever an entity is changing, um, right? Uh, I don't also want to use the word domain or anything like that from domain driven design for that. Um, I just want to say that uh, we have some things that happen over time as events and they affect one, the state of one thing. Um, if that's used as information, with other entities together, um, then we have a product of that, of those two streams. So um, sometimes that may be a product of multiple streams. So in, in the case of the routing slip and the, or not the routing slip, but the, the actual uh, invoice or, or whatever the, what, is he, what do you call that in the, uh, in the cafe when you go in and the old school cafes, it's, it's, it's your order, it's your at the end it's your receipt. It's but it kind of makes its way through, Probably. right? I think, it, I think a lot of businesses, it's an order slip, you know? You yeah, just like... order slip, okay. Um, I'm not sure if that was a cafe thing or not, but anyway, your order slip is just, so is just a thing. 
for the Germans, order slip means uh, receipt, basically, but specifically in a right, cafe. right, right, right. Okay. So wait, wait a minute. Uh, are you talking about the waitress writing down your order? Yeah, on a piece it, it, of paper? in cafes in North America, an old school diner. Um, yeah, you know, they write it on a. Paper yeah, they, just, they have a, you know, you get pads of these things at, at, uh, at your But, but that doesn't store. turn into your receipt. It that does. doesn't turn direct directly into your it receipt. Does, it does. It does. You actually leave with it. Um, in, in, in some of the old ones, really? that's exactly yeah. what they did. Yeah, yeah. You, they but, actually but, but you, get, you, get, you get from the cashier, you get a printout from the cashier. That's the receipt, right? No, well, no. Even before, before then, you, you might get another thing that just tallies up what change you got, especially old school 50s and 60s diners. Um, oh. The till was a sep separate thing. So it was just a pad of paper, maybe carbon copies that they might have if they wanted more. So as you sit down, the waitress has this or the waiter has this and they write down what each person wants. They take, they take that same paper and they put it on this little, this little round thing by the kitchen. And that's a cue as to what they're cooking. So the cooks look and they take the next thing down from this little, uh, from this little round thing that you, with little uh, clothespins really. Um, and so, and it spins around, so it's really a cue. And the cook takes the next one, looks at it, cooks up all that kind of stuff. Once is once he's done cooking all these things, he puts the plates on the on the board, you know, the window for the for the kitchen, and puts the little uh, receipt underneath one of the plates and dings the dings the little bell and says order up. And the you know the waitress goes and looks, and. Uh, and sees, you know, who who that is. Looks at the, uh, looks at the uh, at the at the bill, and if it's, usually it's a small diner, so they remember who ordered what, and you know, goes and brings the food, and then she has that thing in her in her pocket or his pocket, and when the people are ready to leave, um, the, you know, they they basically give them that as a slip. You take it to the till. If there's a separate person that's doing that. You show that same piece of paper, you give them money, you get your change. The only other receipt you'd get is maybe a paper one from, from the till that would, it's essentially a calculator that would tell you what change you would get if you gave them money. They might staple it together to that order for you. That's it.